How many of you are thankful we serve a good God? Amen. I don't know what you came expecting, but I came expecting something from the Lord. Maybe it's just me. You know, I, I had a friend who texted me and he said, Hey, let me, uh, let me get your email. I've got something I want to send you. And I said, uh, I said, okay. He's, a, he's another evangelist, and we haven't been in touch for a long time. But over the past four months, he sent me a report of what the Lord has been doing. He said there are over 524 that have been baptized in the past four months. He sent me a picture of a, of a woman dancing, holding up her cane, and he said her leg was instantly healed in the altar. There was a deaf man with hearing implants who was prayed for who took the hearing implants out in front of the whole congregation and demonstrated that he could hear again. There was a man who was legally blind who was baptized in the name of Jesus and, and when he came up out of the water he could see again. You say, oh, but, but that's just hearsay. No, no. He went to the doctor the very next day and came back with a report and the doctor said, you've got 20-20 vision. A, a witch came out to service and thought that she would interrupt what the Lord was doing and then she decided she needed some backup. Sister Emma, she brought five more witches with her and then something started to move and all six of them were baptized in the name of Jesus. You say, preacher, why are you telling us this? I'm trying to let you know that you're still connected to a body and a kingdom that is moving and that is advancing the cause and the kingdom. Just last night, how many of you know he can still work miracles? Not just, not overseas, not in a state over. He can work them right here. We got a call and they said, we think your, your grandmother is, my mom's mom is, is having some heart issues. They rushed her to the hospital, took her to the cardiologist and said she had a pretty massive heart attack. They called it the widow maker. Some of you know what that is. 100% blockage in the LAD artery. 12% survival rate. But I serve a God. I don't know who you serve, but I serve a God who can reach into the very heart he first formed and restore it back to its proper functions. And when they wheeled my grandmother right next to us in the hospital, she had a smile on her face. And she said, why don't you pray for me? The Lord's been with me in the hospital. You know, I sat right there, Brother Fred, and I said, you know, but I want to give honor to the surgeons and the doctors and the nurses. And, and the Lord spoke to me. He's never told me this before. He said, yes, my word says, give honor where honor is due. But you better never forget the glory belongs to me. I give honor to every doctor. I give honor to every surgeon. But the glory belongs to God. You know, there's an old adage, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. But you can salt him along the way. What does that mean? That means you might not be hungry or thirsty for the things of God right now, but by the time I'm done with you. If you have your Bibles, would you go with me to the book of Matthew chapter 14? I want to give honor to our pastor in his absence. He was up and... He was, uh, I think I'm under the impression he was helping in the wedding. I think he spoke a little bit. And, and a lot of our church family is out, and they've gone that way to Chicago. And I think it's 15 hours, roughly, roughly 15 hours away. But um, I still believe we can have a move of God. Amen. The Bible says we're two or three. Where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of them. I want to give honor also to Miss Denisha. Diana, Braley, and Jessica, right? I got all four right. They came. Sister Diana, we've been doing Bible studies with her, and she wants to be baptized. 
in the only saving name of Jesus. And I think that's my friend Chris that walked in back there. There he is. We just had, we met with him, and he said he wanted to be baptized in the only saving name of Jesus. So I'm just excited for what the Lord wants to do. And lastly, I want to give honor to my wife and my precious little baby and my brother who was on baby duty. Everybody say, God help him. And uh, I got her ready this morning, and in my defense, I don't know how to put bonnets on, so I put it on backwards. And then I did what any smart individual would do, and I held her up in the mirror with the biggest smile on my face and took a picture because I was happy. I thought I did a good job. And then I walk into the conference room, and they're all holding it up and giggling at me. So God be my helper, please. Matthew chapter 14, starting at verse 22. I know I've kept you standing, so I will read quickly. And I won't keep you here long if you promise to preach with me. I'll make a deal with you. I'll start my timer right now. If you preach with me, I will not preach longer than 30 minutes. Oh, he said take my time. Oh, yeah. Come on. Who came to have a move of God? Matthew chapter 14, starting in verse 22, the Bible says, And straightway Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. And when he had sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. And when the evening was come, he was there alone. But the ship was now in the midst of the sea, tossed with waves, for the wind was contrary. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's about three o'clock in the morning, the Bible says Jesus went unto them walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled. Isn't that interesting? How many of you get troubled when you see Jesus? They were troubled saying it is a spirit. And they cried out for fear, but straightway Jesus spake unto them saying, be of good cheer. It is I, be not afraid. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. And when Peter was come down out of the ship, he walked on the water. I know we tend to forget we only remember Peter for sinking, but let me just read that one more time. Peter walked on the water. But when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid. And beginning to sink, he cried, saying, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus stretched forth his hand and called him, said unto him, O thou of little faith, wherefore didst thou doubt? And when they were coming to the ship, the wind was ceased. Then they that were in the ship came and worshipped him, saying, Of a truth, thou art the Son of God. I want to preach just for a moment. There are troubled waters in his perfect will. There are troubled waters in his perfect will. Would you put your Bibles down? Would you lift up your voice to the Lord one more time? God, we love you. God, I understand that you gave me a word for these people and in this moment during this season, and I pray that I would deliver your word with anointing and clarity. Let it be the hammer that breaks in part the pieces of the rock. And, and God, I pray that there would just be a demonstration of your spirit that would follow, confirm your word with signs following. I pray that the best gifts would be an operation. I pray that the angels of the Lord would ascend and descend in this very house and we'll be careful. We give the musicians honor. We give the speakers honor. We give the saints honor. But the glory, we give it only to you. And if you're going to help me preach, would you clap your hands before you're seated? Amen. And you may be seated. Oftentimes, when we read through Scripture, we stay so focused on what's being said, but sometimes we miss what is not being said. I have found that some of the deepest revelations are not in the forefront of the text, but rather in the details. And if we're not careful, those revelations will slip past our attention and fall by the wayside. Uh, just for an example, in the Old Testament, there was a prophet who was truth-sayer to King David by the name of Ahithophel. 
And some people have never heard of Ahithophel, but if you read in the Old Testament account, Sister Emma, the Bible said his word never failed. There was actually a translation that said Ahithophel was so close to the Lord that when Ahithophel spoke, it was as if the Lord God himself was speaking. Ahithophel was a character in the background. You, you want to know why David was so victorious? It's because he had a prophet named Ahithophel by his side who advised him and said, go to war when you need to go to war and said, halt when he needed to halt. Ahithophel was in the details. But then we read a time when kings were supposed to be out at war. That was the springtime. And David stayed back and found himself on the rooftop. And if you go back and read, the Bible said first he looked and then he saw Bathsheba. There's a difference between looking and seeing. I'll just leave that there. He just looked and then he saw. And we know how the story goes. She, she had a husband And uh, David sent him out in the front lines and he died in war so David could take his wife Bathsheba. Truly a grievous sin committed by this king. But we know that the Lord restored King David. And during the revolt of Absalom, when Absalom was subduing the kingdom of Israel, David fled with his mighty men. And here's the problem. When Absalom took the throne, being young and inexperienced, he didn't understand the weight Ahithophel carried. And Ahithophel came to him and said, you need to pursue David. He's weak right now. You can take the kingdom. And it was true. But him being young and foolish, he dismissed the word of Ahithophel and instead trusted a secondary advisor by the name of Hushai. You say, preacher, why are you telling me this? Give me just a second. And then when Ahithophel's counsel was denied by the son of David, we read something very tragic. Ahithophel went out and took his very own life. And I thought, Sister Emma, what, what, what's going on? But then you read in the details, come to find out Ahithophel was the grandfather of Bathsheba. So what you read is what you see, but what you don't read is that there was an offense that was festering in the heart of Ahithophel. And he was waiting for an opportunity to come against David and he, he harbored that offense and, and the same, in the same token one of those details in Matthew chapter 14 is subtle and you might miss it if you don't read closely and in our opening text Jesus has just performed a miracle for the multitude. He has taken the two fish and five loaves of bread multiplied it and fed thousands. Afterwards, the multitudes were dismissed, and Jesus departed alone to pray. But while he went to pray, he sent his disciples into the sea. And while they were attempting to cross the Sea of Galilee, a storm began to rage and threw the disciples into a state of panic. Now, this is what we read. This is the forefront of the text. But what we lose in the details is the fact that the disciples, those who were closest to Jesus, are now faced with a storm. All the while those who were distant, those who were in the multitude, they they got to witness a miracle and run. They were provided for miraculously and then they were sent on their way to go back home to their families. But the disciples, those who were serving, those who were ministering, those who were what we would call faithful, the ones who were gathering the fragments, handing out the food, dealing with the public somehow, some reason, they were the ones sent through a storm. Let, let, me, let me put it like this. Those who were trying their dead level best to live for God, to serve the Lord, they were the ones who had to navigate through a storm, not the multitude. 
Is there a saint in the house that understands the closer you get to the Lord, the more the enemy sets you in his sight? And sometimes the presence of an attack and the presence of a storm does not dismiss the relevancy of God being active in your current season, but it might just be you're getting closer to the Lord. I've had some people say I've never been attacked like by the devil like I have when I started trying to live for the Lord. That's the truth. You don't even know spiritual warfare until you try to live for the Lord. You don't even know the onslaughts and the attacks of the enemy until you make a commitment that I'm going to serve the Lord. And it would be easy for anyone to look from an outside perspective and say, that's not fair. And if there's any argument I've heard over the years being a minister, it's that life isn't fair. They say, how can there be a God in the presence of suffering? Why doesn't he put an end to it all? And I had to tell one, well, he did one time, and you, you ridicule him for that too. And you say, how could a loving God just wipe out everybody? Well, what do you want? Do you want him to kill everybody in a flood or let you have free will? No, no, here's the problem. Frank Turek said, if I could prove to you the existence of Jesus, would you then believe? Most of the time they won't. They use it as a, they use it as a cover up and they say, that's not fair. That doesn't make any sense. Why does it look like God is punishing the disciples who have stood by so faithfully? I mean, don't you remember they were the ones who left everything they love, everything they knew to follow after you. And this is how you treat them. I mean, come on. You can feed 5,000 with scraps. I think everybody knows you can see the storm coming. You could, you could look through the Spirit. You could reach in to your very own divinity and, and see it in the future. Why wouldn't you just wait and send them across later? Maybe, just maybe, they had a divine appointment with a storm. I'm here to tell somebody that the storm you're going through is in the perfect will of God. It's not by an accident. That's okay. I'm going to preach it. It didn't happen out of nowhere. But this is exactly how God has planned it. I don't know who this is for, but somebody hear me. You've been serving. You've been pouring. You've been doing everything you know to do. But for some reason, you've been hit by a storm. You've been hit by calamity. You've been struck by a struggle and you're wondering, how did this come out of left field? I, I didn't see it coming. God, why would you let it blindside me? And some of you, some of you are just like the disciples right now. The Bible said that they saw Jesus, but thought he was an evil spirit. Y'all not hearing me just yet. Some of you are staring right into the face of God. Right into the will of God. Right into the plan of God. But the storm has convinced you that you're looking at the workings of a devil. Oh, I'm in the book right now. How is it that the ones who were closest had such a misunderstanding of the appearance of God? How is it those who knew him seemed to miss his presence in a crucial moment, he was walking right in front of them. He was moving right in front of them. He was working right in front of them. Dare I say, he was performing a miracle right in front of them. But they thought the enemy was at work. Let me tell you something. I don't know. I, I can't see everything. But what I do know is this. What's going on in the spirit right now might look a little crazy. But I've got a word from the Lord. This storm didn't come from a devil. This season didn't derive from an evil spirit. But what is happening in your life right now is the will of God. Because somebody, that's okay, you don't have to like it. Somebody has a divine appointment with Jesus. 
Jesus. You're on God's radar. You're right in his focus. You might not realize it yet. Oh, but you will. You might not understand it yet, but soon you will. You're in the plan of God. You're in the eyes of God. You are in the will of God. So the disciples thought it was a spirit. They thought it was evil. Their minds were warped and afraid. But then this happened. Somehow, could you put up verse 27 for me? This happened. Now, when you read it, it looks, it looks pretty normal. But remember, put yourself in their shoes for a second. If, if somebody could envision with me, high-speed winds were howling. Waves were battering and tossing the boat back and forth. Things on the ship were turning and knocking over flashes of lightning, strokes of thunder. Torrential rains were pelting the ship and, and drenching the disciples. If, if you've ever driven through a storm or, or been in your house during a storm, you, you know that a storm is not a quiet atmosphere. This was a storm that was bad enough to scare the fishermen who had spent their lives on that sea. It had to have been pretty severe. It, it wasn't peaceful. It wasn't still. But somehow, somehow, the voice of God was able to pierce now, some of you don't get it yet. The voice of Jesus was able to move through the sound of thunder, through the crashing of lightning, through the battering of waves, through the cries of the disciples who were screaming at one another. The voice of God was able to travel through the storm and reach them right where they were. Did you come to preach with me? Somebody hear this crazy preacher. I don't care how crazy things are. I don't care how chaotic the storm is. God can speak to you right where you are. There's just something about the voice of God that can bypass your pain. I said there's just something about the voice of God that can bypass your trauma bypass depression bypass anxiety somebody hear me the voice of God will bypass your failures it will bypass your mistakes it will bypass the abuse the affliction the struggle maybe maybe I can get a witness in the house the voice of God found you in the middle of your storm when the abuse was screaming louder than any other voice when the pain when the affliction when the trauma seemed to rage in your mind the voice of God found you in the middle he spoke right through your struggle he spoke I know Brother Wheeler's not here, but I still came to preach. No, no, no. I, I believe I can have a move of God. Brother CL, I, I've, been in, I've been in a classroom. I, I've been in a home missions church where they didn't even have a building. I had to go and preach in a classroom, and we still had a move of God. I've been in places nearing thousands, and we had a move of God. So I don't know what you came to do, but I came to have a move of God. Mm. Mm. I'm just going to move into the spirit a little bit. I texted Brother Wheeler a week ago and I said, something is praying on your absence. There's a spirit that's trying to creep up and hinder the people of God. But let me tell you something. We can have a move of God whenever we want. I'll drive it out if I have to. I said we can have a move of God right here if you want to. But it's up to you. So I don't know what you came to do. But this crazy, skinny, apostolic preacher is craving a demonstration of God's spirit. 
Did the voice of God find anybody else? And he found you in the middle of your storm, in the middle of your struggle. And he spoke to you the same thing. He said to the disciples a long time ago, he said, it is I. That's all he did was reaffirm his identity. What they thought was an evil spirit, the voice of God was able to pierce through the lies and the deception and said, hey, it's me. Hold your head up. I'm here. Come on, I hear the voice of God speaking through the storm right now to somebody saying, I'm here. He's saying, I'm right here. I know it's hard for you to see me. I know the storm is clouding your vision. They didn't know it was Jesus, but Jesus said the storm didn't cloud mine. Somebody, somebody catch that. The disciples could barely see 10 feet in front of them, but in the middle of a 65 mile wide sea. Let me put it in, in perspective for some people who live around here. Toledo Bend, that's 65 miles. Toledo Bend is about 65 miles too, the same size of the Sea of Galilee. And you're telling me, Brother Nick, that Jesus walked right up to their boat? He's saying, you might not see me. But I see you. You might have lost sight of me, but I never lost sight of you. That's why I can find you in the middle of a raging sea. That's why I can find you in the middle of a storm, in the middle of chaos, and get right up in your business because I know exactly where you are. Uh, uh, most people would never catch this. But you need to see what's going on here. Jesus is hovering over dark and stormy waters. Envision this. Jesus, and, and maybe it's just me, I think very literally. Um, raging storms are not an even surface. So how was he walking on the waves? And then we go back to Genesis 1. In the beginning, God created heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Uh, somebody's not getting the picture yet. And now here we see the Word of God hovering over the face of the waters. And then I know the text in red letters, he says, it is I. But the Greek, it's only two words. He said, I am. And, and some of you know the name that he spoke to Moses, the Tetragrammaton. He said, I am that I am. But that was in an imperfect future tense. So what the Lord really spoke to Moses was, he said, I will be what I will be. And then we see the word of God hovering over the face of the waters. And he spoke in current tense. He said, I am. I'm the one they spoke about long ago. I'm the one that was hovering over the face of the waters in Genesis 1. Now, check this out. Some of you don't miss this. Peter, who was the spokesperson of the church. Remember what Peter symbolized. He symbolizes Pentecost. He symbolizes the bride. He said, Lord, if it is you, bid me that I may come. And what did he do? I word it like this. The Lord invited him to partake of the divine nature that was once breathed in him in Genesis chapter 2. Mm. He said, there's divinity on the inside of you. And now I've asked you to be seated with me in heavenly places. Now some of you aren't missing it. The storm was not natural. But as they began to call... As they begin to draw near to the Lord, the Lord departed for a season to pray. And he said, God, hmm. he said, they've been pulling on my divinity. What can I do? And you mean to tell me he just happens to walk right up to the side of their boat in a 65-mile wide sea? No, no. You want to know what he was doing? 
He was opening up a window. He opened up a door in the Spirit. And what did the Bible say when he got back onto the boat? It said they remembered not the miracle of the loaves. That was the miracle that happened right before. And remember, they were involved. They were involved in the miracle. God said, I want you to help serve. I want you to gather up the fragments that nothing be lost. And Jesus said, I need you to help me in this miracle. And in the same way, he comes walking on the sea and is asking them yet again to participate in another miracle. But here's the thing. Ah. Peter, who represented the church, who represents some of you right now, you've been asking the Lord, I want to go deeper. I want to see more. I want to hear more. And the Lord is opening up a window. And this certain season of trouble is your opportunity to pursue what the Lord has for you. And Peter said, bid me that I may come. And he said, come. And the Bible says, like I pointed out, Peter walked on the water. But, but, the Bible says he saw the winds boisterous, took his eyes off of the Lord. But here is what I love about Matthew's account. In Matthew 14, he said, and Peter beginning to sink. Maybe I'm a crazy preacher, but Sister Emma, you know what that tells me? He didn't sink. He was beginning to. Oh, there is a difference between sinking and beginning to sink. And I see some of you in here, you're beginning to sink. But what I see right now is the Lord stopping by right where you are. And the Bible said immediately, Jesus stretched forth his hand and picked him up. Come on, somebody is beginning to sink. But I'm here to let you know, you're not going to sink. You're not going under. But the Lord has stepped in right in the middle of your storm. And he's here to pick you you back up he was beginning to sink I'm I'm coming to a close musicians can come the Bible said at the pool of Bethesda that there was a certain season of trouble when the angel descended the Bible said he would descend during a certain season and trouble the waters and like I said you, you might miss it if you don't pay attention but check out this principle those who were willing to walk on troubled waters were the ones who received a miracle those who were willing to press through into what was unknown those who were willing to embrace the storm to embrace the season of trouble, they're the ones who saw the miraculous. Let me, let me word it like this. I believe walking on the water was one of the most prolific miracles in the Bible. Amen? It's pretty cool. <laughs> but here's the thing. There have got to be stormy waters to walk on if we want to label Peter a storm walker. No, 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 you're not catching me. When they said Lazarus is already dead, you know what Jesus said? This was supposed to happen. Because until now, you have only known me as the healer. But how did he finish the verse? But soon you will know me as the resurrection. Mm. Mm. Some of you are facing things you've never fought before. What the Lord is speaking to you is the same thing he spoke to Moses. He said, then they only knew me as Jehovah Jireh. They only knew me as El Shaddai. But by my name, Jehovah Nisi, was I not known to them. But I will make it known unto you. The certain season of trouble is in the perfect will of God. Why? Because it's his way of exposing his nature. It's his way of inviting you deeper and saying, you've only known me one way, but this certain season of trouble, you're going to see me in a light like you've never seen me before. They said, when, when the man was lame, they said, who did sin? Was it him? Was it, his, what is it? was it his parents, Sister Michelle? 
Jesus said, neither. But this was done that the Lord might be glorified. And what you're going through right now, you're saying, what? Did I mess up? Did I, did I, did I, where did I go wrong? And the Lord is saying, no, no. I'm about to get the glory out of this. Mm. I feel a stirring right now, sister. It's all over me. So I'm going to offer you the same invitation Jesus did. They said, if this is really you, God, if this is really what I've been looking for, bid me to come. You know what I hear the Lord saying right now? I hear him saying, come. Let me prove to you that this isn't the workings of an evil spirit. Let me prove to you that this storm was not caused by the enemy. No, but in the middle of a 65 mile wide sea, Sister Emma, he just so happened to be walking right next to their And I like what Mark's account says. In Mark chapter 6, verse 48, to me, again, it is one of the most prolific verses in all of Scripture. Sister Emma, you know what the Lord said? It said that the Lord was passing by. And then for some reason, Mark added a detail and said, and would have passed them by. But they cried out. You want to know what your catalyst is for a divine visitation? It is whether or not you are willing to respond to what the Lord is doing. How many of you know that the woman with the issue of blood would have remained in her condition had she not got up from where she were? said I'm going to pursue the Lord the, the, the blind Bartimaeus would still be blind Bartimaeus had he listened to the people but the Bible said he cried out all the more louder and said Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me and the Bible said Jesus stopped Jesus reached out and Jesus began to minister I'm here to tell somebody right now that Jesus is passing through the house and the catalyst for a divine visitation is if you're willing to reach, to press, to cry out and say, God, if this is really you, bid me to come. Bid me to walk on the water. Reveal what it is you're doing in this troubled season. As they continue to play and sing, I want to offer you the same invitation Jesus did. This church has been asking to go deeper, and I believe that there are open heavens. I believe the door is open. The window is open. But you're going to have to press through what you view as unknown. I just got back from New Orleans last week. And while I was there, I can't even begin to explain the things that I felt. And what took place in our services were abnormal sister Dana they, they weren't normal and I could feel it people were saying I'm not used to this this is unusual the Lord spoke to me and he said what I'm doing in this end time hour is not normal no no normal church normal church will not draw an end time revival or an end time harvest no the day of Pentecost happened the Bible said when they were in one accord in one place and they tarried in prayer for days you say preacher what are you doing what I always do I'm here to stir somebody
walk deeper. The Lord is inviting you to be seated in heavenly places. He's calling you higher. He's calling you somewhere else. He said you are living below your identity and I need you to rule and reign with me in heavenly places because I didn't call you to identify with your carnal nature but I've called you higher. promise to relent as they begin to play I wonder if there's a Peter in the house who is willing to take a step out on waters that are troubled Ah. and say I've got my eyes on you Jesus I'm not going to let the storm move me. I'm not going to let calamity move me. I'm not going to let the chaos and the cares of this world knock me around no but I'm going to keep my eyes planted on the anchor of my soul.